Rorik or Rorik was a Danish Viking, who ruled over different parts of Friesland between 841 and 873. Since the 19th century, there have been attempts to identify him with Rorik, the founder of the Russian royal dynasty. This identification remains uncertain. Family he had a brother named Harold. Harold Clack was probably their uncle, and Godfred Haraldson the cousin. The identity of his father remains uncertain. There are various interpretations of the primary sources on his family, particularly because names such as Harold are repeated in the text with little effort to distinguish one holder of a name from another. But Harold Clack had at least three brothers. Anulo, Ranfried and Hemming half Danson. Any of them could be the father of the younger Harold and Rorik. Several writers have chosen Hemming for chronological reasons, estimating Rorik was born following the eight tens. This remains a plausible theory, not an unquestionable conclusion. Early life Harold the Younger had been exiled from Denmark and had raided Frisia for several years. He had entered an alliance with Lothair I who was involved in conflict against Louis the Pious, his father. Frisia was part of Louis' lands and the raids were meant to weaken him. By 841, Louis was dead and Lothair was able to grant Harold and Rorik several parts of Friesland. His goal at the time was to establish the military presence of his loyalists in Frisia, securing it against his siblings and political rivals Louis the German and Charles the Bald. The two Norsemen used islands as a main base of operations, the seat of Rorik being the island of Wieringen. While Harold operated from the island of Waltrin, and they also ruled Dorestad at this time. In the early 840s, Frisia seemed to attract fewer raids than in the previous decade. Viking raiders were turning their attention to West Francia and Anglo-Saxon England. In 843 Lothair, Louis and Charles signed the Treaty of Erden, settling their territorial disputes. Lothair previously needed Rorik and Harold to defend Frisia from external threats. With the seeming elimination of such threats, the two Vikings may have outlived their usefulness to their overlord. In about 844, both fell into disgrace. They were accused of treason and imprisoned. The chronicles of the time report out on the accusation. Rorik would later manage to escape. Harold probably died while a prisoner. According to an 850 entry of the Anna Alfaldenses, Rorik the Norseman held the Vicus Dorostad as a benefice with his brother Harold in the time of the Emperor Louis. After the death of the emperor and his brother, he was denounced as a traitor, falsely as it is said, to Lothar, who had succeeded his father in the kingdom, and was captured and imprisoned. He escaped and became the faithful man of Louis, king of the eastern Franks. After he had stayed there for some years, living among the Saxons, who were neighbors of the Norsemen. He collected a not insubstantial force of Danes and began a career of piracy, devastating places near the northern coasts of Lothar's kingdom, and he came through the mouth of the river Rhine to Dorostad, seized and held it, because the emperor Lothar was unable to drive him out without danger to his own men. Rorik was received back into fealty on the advice of his counselors and through mediators on condition that he would faithfully handle the taxes and other matters pertaining to the royal FISC, and would resist the piratical attacks of the Danes. The Annalbertiniani also records the event. Rorik, the nephew of Harold, who had recently defected from Lothar, raised whole armies of Norsemen with a vast number of ships and laid waste Frisia and the island of Betuwa and other places in that neighborhood by sailing up the Rhine and the Vaal. Lothar, since he could not crush him, received him into his allegiance and granted him Dorostad and other counties. The Annals and Tenses briefly report. Rorik the Norseman, brother of the mentioned younger Harold, who was earlier dishonored by Lothar, fled, demanded Dorostad back, deceitfully inflicted much evil on the Christians, ruler of Dorostad. After Rorik, together with Godfred Haraldson, conquered Dorostad and Utrecht in 850, Emperor Lothair I had to acknowledge him as ruler of most of Friesland. 
Dorostad had been one of the most prosperous ports in northern Europe for quite some time. By accepting Rorik as one of his subjects, Lothair managed to keep the city as a part of his realm. His sovereignty was still recognized. For example, the coinage produced at the local mint would continue to bear the name of the emperor. On the other hand, Dorostad was already in economic decline. Leaving it to its fate was not much of a risk for the welfare of his state. Bishop Hunger of Utrecht had to move to Deventa. Later on, together with Godfrid, Rorik went to Denmark to try and gain power during the Danish Civil War of 854, but this wasn't a success. The Analbertiniani reports, Lothar gave the whole of Frisia to his son Lothar, whereupon Rorik and Gotrik headed back to their native Denmark in the hope of gaining royal power. Rorik and Gotrik, on whom success had not smiled, remained based at Dorostad and held sway over most of Frisia. Godfred is not mentioned again and could have died not long of his return. The extent of Rorik's area of control at the time is uncertain. In Carolingian coinage and the Vikings, historian Simon Copeland made an educated guess based on primary sources. Rorik's recorded control over the city Gent on the bank of the Val River suggests the river formed the southern border of the area. The Kernemaland is also mentioned as part of Rorik's area of control. Later negotiations with Louis the German would probably mean Rorik's area shared its eastern borders with East Francia. The western border is more obscure. Rorik and his brother controlled the islands of Zealand in the 840s. There is no later mention of them in connection to Rorik, which could mean the ruler of Dorostad had never regained control over them. Expedition to Denmark According to an 857 entry in the Analfaldenses, Rorik the Norseman, who ruled in Dorostad, took a fleet to the Danish boundaries with the agreement of his lord King Lothar, and with the agreement of Hawkeart King of the Danes. He and his comrades occupied the part of the kingdom which lies between the sea and the Ida, which means Rorik, with Lothair's encouragement, went to Denmark and forced King Horik II to recognize his rule over a significant area. The Ida River formally marked the border between Denmark and the Carolingian Empire. Copeland estimates the region gained to have lain to the north or northeast of the river and to have stretched to Schlei, a narrow inlet of the Baltic Sea. Though not mentioned by the chronicler, Rorik may have taken control over Hedeby, a significant trade center of the area. The historian considers Hedeby would be a valuable prize for Rorik. He considers the motivation of Lothair to be to use the new port to increase trade between his realm of Lotharingia and the region of Scandinavia. However, raids in Rorik's own territory are reported by the Analbertiniani. Other Danes stormed the emporium called Dorostad and ravaged the whole island of Betua and other neighboring districts. Copland considers this indicates Lothair's plans had backfired. Left unguarded, Dorostad and its surrounding area were easy prey for other Scandinavian raiders. Even Utrecht was sacked this year. The Frankish chroniclers are silent on the subject but Rorik was presumably recalled in haste by Lothair to defend Frisia. His conquests across the Danish borders were apparently short-lived. They are next mentioned as administered by Danish monarchs in 873. Questions on loyalty An 863 entry of the Analbertiniani reports, In January Danes sailed up the Rhine towards Cologne. After sacking the emporium called Dorostad and also a fairly large villa at which the Frisians had taken refuge, and after slaying many Frisian traders and taking captive large numbers of people, then they reached a certain island near the fort of Neuss. Lothar came up and attacked them with his men along one bank of the Rhine and the Saxons along the other and they encamped there until about the 
Beginning of April, the Danes therefore followed the advice of Rorik and withdrew by the same way they had come. The entry makes clear that another group of Danish raiders had attacked Dorostad before travelling upstream to Xantin. However a rumour soon circulated that Rorik had encouraged the raiders on their expedition. Copeland dismisses the idea that Rorik could have invited a raid on his own area. He suggests the rumour was based on his method of getting rid of the invaders. Rorik could have protected his own territory by convincing the Danes to travel further up the river, effectively letting them become other rulers' problems. Copeland notes it would not be a unique case in the 9th century. The siege of Paris from 885 to 886 under Siegfried and Rollo had not ended with mutual annihilation. Charles the Fat had simply allowed Rollo to go and plunder Burgundy. The rumour of Rorik's apparent disloyalty induced Hinkmar, Archbishop of Reims, to write two letters, one to Hunger and one to Rorik. Bishop Hunger was instructed to impose a suitable penance on Rorik if the rumour was found to be true. Hinkmar also told Rorik not to shelter Baldwin I of Flanders, who had eloped with the king's daughter Judith. From these letters it becomes clear that Rorik had recently converted to Christianity and been baptized. Flauduad summarizes the content of the two letters, the first to Bishop Hunger about the excommunication of Baldwin, who stole the widow Judith, the daughter of the king, to become in his wife, whereupon he was excommunicated by the bishop. He also admonishes Hunger to persuade Rorik the Norseman, who recently was converted to the Christian faith, not to receive or protect Baldwin, and also, if other Norsemen with his consent, as has been told, should have raided the kingdom after his conversion, he should be corrected with a proper punishment. The other, to Rorik the Norseman, who was converted to the Christian faith, so that he always might benefit to do the will of God and exercise his orders, as he had heard from many to do so, that nobody should persuade him acting against the Christians with advice or aid to benefit the heathens, else it would not have been in his advantage that he had received the Christian baptism, as he himself or through others should have planned perverse or hostile affairs, and so on. As follows, it was made clear to him in an episcopal way how much danger was hidden in such a machination. He was also admonished not to receive Baldwin, who was excommunicated by the Spirit of God, for which reason the holy canon was drawn up by means of episcopal authority, because he had stolen the daughter of the king to become in his wife, and he should not allow consolation nor refuge on his part whatsoever so he and his men should not get involved in his sins and excommunication and get doomed themselves, but he should take care to present himself in a way that he could benefit from the prayers of the saints. Copland finds the contents of the letters particularly revealing. Rorik had apparently been granted control over Dorostad twice and well before his conversion to Christianity in the early 860s. Hinkmar and Hunger having to convince Rorik not to give refuge to a declared enemy of Charles the Bald would mean Rorik enjoyed a measure of political independence from the various courts of the Carolingian dynasty at the time. Copeland notes that his contemporary Sir Julius Scotus calls Rorik a king, though noting that the reference has alternatively been interpreted to mean another contemporary ruler, Rodri the Great of the Kingdom of Gwyneth. A hagiography of Adalbert of Egmond, written in the late 10th century, mentions a miracle of the saint in the time of Rorik the Barbarian King, later rule. In 867 there was a local revolt by the Kokingi and Rorik was driven out of Frisia. The Annalbertiniani report that Lothair II summoned up the host throughout his realm to the defense of the fatherland, as he explained, against the Norsemen, for he expected that Rorik, whom the local people, the new name for them as Kokings, had driven out of Frisia, would return bringing Simdanes to help him. Copland notes that the identity of the Kokingi is uncertain. Also uncertain is the nature of this loss of power by Rorik. Rorik could have lost control of only part of his realm or to have resumed control rather quickly. 
because he is next mentioned in 870, still in Frisia. On 8 August 869, Lothair II died. Lotharingia was claimed by his uncles, Louis the German and Charles the Bald. In 870, the two came to an agreement with the Treaty of Meissen which divided Lotharingia among them. The Annal Bettiniani report that Charles the Bald went to the palace of Nijmegen to hold discussions with the Norseman Roerich whom he bound to himself by a treaty. Copland considers the talks were between a ruler and a leading local figure of a newly annexed area. Charles secured his loyalty and recognition of his sovereignty. Rorick kept control of his region. The same type of agreement Lothair I and Lothair II had with him. Charles and Rorick seem to have restarted negotiations in 872, according to two separate entries of the Annalbertiniani. On 20 January he, Charles the Bald, left Compendio and went to the monastery of name missing in surviving manuscripts to hold talks with the Norseman Rorik and Rudolf. In October he, Charles the Bald, came by boat down the Meuse to Maastricht and held talks with the Norseman Rorik and Rudolf who had come up the river to meet him. He gave a gracious reception to Rorik who had proved loyal to him, but Rudolf he dismissed empty-handed, because he had been plotting acts of treachery and pitching his demands too high. Charles prepared his faithful men for defence against treacherous attacks of Rudolf. Then he rode back by way of Attany to Saint Medard's Abbey, where he, Charles, spent Christmas. The Rudolf of the text was Rudolf Haraldson, a presumed nephew of Rorik. The Annals and Tenses mention him as Nepus of Rorik which typically means nephew. However like in the term Cardinal Nephew, the term can also have the meaning of a relative without specifying the relation. Copeland suggests the monastery mentioned was Moustiers or Samba in the modern Namur province of Belgium, close to the former borders of Lotharingia. The reason and nature of these negotiations is obscure. In 873, Rorik swore allegiance to Louis, and that is the last that is heard of him. The Annals and Tenses report. Likewise came to him, Louis, Rorik, the Gaul of Christianity. Nevertheless many hostages were put back in the ships and he became subject of the king and was bound by an oath to keep a firm loyalty. Copeland notes that Rorik held lands in both sides of the current border between the realms of Charles and Louis which would mean he owed loyalty to both of them, leaving him in an unenviable position. Death Rorik died before 882 when his lands were given to see King Godfried. According to the Annalbertiniani, Charles, who had the title of emperor, marched against the Norsemen with a large army and advanced right up to their fortification. Once he got there, however, his courage failed him. Through the intervention of certain men, he managed to reach an agreement with Gotrick and his men on the following terms, namely that Gotrick would be baptized, and would then receive Frisia and the other regions that Rorik had held. Dorostad was in economic decline throughout his reign, merchants migrating to cities less exposed to the constant fighting like Deventer and Teal. Both of the later were developing in merchant towns at the time. Copeland considers Rorik the most powerful and influential of all the Danes drawn into the Carolingian milieu of the 9th century. He notes how four Carolingian monarchs accepted his presence in Frisia and his continued service as their vassal. Little criticism against him was recorded in the Frankish chronicles of his time. Even Hinkmar did not outright accuse him and expected him to accept penance like a good Christian, which indicated the Franks had ceased thinking of him as a foreign element to their realm, regarding Rorik as one of their own. The historian also notes that there are only two recorded raids of his area in 23 known years of rule, a record of his effectiveness in defense in an era of turbulence.